Thanks, Robin. Um, welcome to Fundraising for Sanctuaries. We have a very busy agenda this morning, so I'll just uh, quickly say hello. We have we are excited to be doing this with Possets, our first webinar together, and bringing people together across continents. We have four great panelists today, and I want to thank all of them for putting together some great slides for us and being ready to tell us about how they approach storytelling online. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator and panel facilitator this morning, Jean Fleming from PASA. Thank you for doing this, Jean. Um, why don't you say hello and introduce our first presenter. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, it's my pleasure to be with you today and to share, um, help share the amazing information that these folks have put together for us. Um, since we have a lot going on, uh, I think we'll just jump into it. And I'm going to ask uh, Itzaso from uh, Luiro Primate Rehabilitation Center to get us started. Uh, so take it away, Itzaso. It's sad, so it looks like your um, line is muted, your computer line is muted. I don't know if you're talking yet or not, but there you go. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm Itzaso from Luiro Primates Rehabilitation Center. And today, because we have little time, I'm just going to explain a, a recent a success example of e storytelling. Is is taking time to ah uh, okay going back is it working okay for you or it might be moving a little slow since you're so far yeah. away it's a slow we can see right now we can see grape girl success story uh, yeah. ah okay okay so yeah grape girl Actually, we were pretty lucky with this history and we weren't expecting such an impact in, in our followers. But um, when I, I was picking up uh, Kiungu, is her name, uh, after she was confiscated, uh, we noticed I had some grapes with me and we noticed she loves grapes. So in DRC, they are quite expensive. So we thought, why not to ask our followers to buy um, a package of grapes for her? So we post a video of uh, Kiungu eating grapes. And um, we knew, uh, we were aware that it was also a video that it might seem too cute. You know, baby chimps are very cute. So actually, we, we post the video with the conservation message on it. So everyone who will share the video will share also the conservation message. And uh, we write on the video that the, this, this little chimpanzee was a, a victim of poaching and, pet, and bush meat trade. So everyone who will share the video will share also our message. And uh, yeah, instead of asking for money, we ask uh, our followers if they could buy a packet for grapes for her. And actually, as I say, we were lucky because the video was was perfect. Uh, you can see Kiungu at the end when the grapes are finished to taking the the packets, like saying, "Hey, where are my grapes? I want I want more grapes." So I think everybody understood that she really liked them. And uh, yeah, we, we were very successful. We got more than 100 donations in 24 hours. Unfortunately, we were not yet in the egg giving day, but uh, we were happy with the answer. So I think uh, an important factor of uh, this storytelling was that we could show the impact of their contribution almost immediately. And uh, when we saw that the, the reaction of the followers was very positive, we went to Bukavu to buy more packets of grapes for her. And uh, in 44 hours, we, we put a thank you post with uh, Kiungu with her packets. And actually, people uh, donate again 
because they, they wanted to be part of, of this history. So I'm not uh, I'm I'm not an expert of uh, social media or anything like that, but I think this story was success was a success for three major points. That uh, the first one was that instead of asking people to donate money, we asked them if they could buy a simple item, which uh, cost six six dollars, and everyone could afford it. And it doesn't mean that we only got $6 donations that we did, but we also got $200 donation and uh, so on. And also we got some monthly donations because people wanted to, to buy packets for her for every month. And another important thing, uh, I, as I say, we were lucky and uh, people nicknamed her as a great girl. And I think that helped to engage with the individual because sometimes maybe the names we put to the chimpanzees are a bit difficult for the general people because mostly they are in Swahili. But the, the fact that they, they nicknamed her great girl, I think it helped to, for them to get attached to, to this history. And also, the, as I was saying, we were able to show the, the donors the immediate impact of their donation. And um, I'm thinking like when you are training a dog, that the trainer tells you that the, the awareness to go immediately after the dog does the trick that you want to, them to do. And don't get me wrong, but I think psychologically it helps that uh, we can show them the, the product no, of their donation fast. And I know it's not always easy because sometimes we are asking money for construction or for long-term um, projects. But uh, I think if we can, we should do this kind of you know, fast impact stories where the people can see almost immediately where their money went. So, um, in general, what I think it works for us is like when the people connect with certain animal and new arrivals are usually a good opportunity for, for people to get attached and um, it's, info, it's important for us to show them the, the improvements of this particular animal. And I know also it's not always easy because, for example, in our case, in the last two months, we had four new arrivals. And of course, we don't have time to, to show the, the, how the animals uh, evolve, no? But at least if we choose one that the people really got, uh, really like it, the history, then we should keep them posted about this animal and especially emotionally, because uh, as you know, the animals, when they arrive, they arrive broken and they arrive with uh, psychologically traumatized. And you can easily see that in their faces. And uh, I don't know, but I think especially chimpanzees maybe, they, they improve pretty fast. So we are able to also show them what our work, the impact of our work in their rehabilitation, psychological rehabilitation too. And um, I'm also, I also think that rescues are a good opportunity to raise awareness because we are able to tell the history, to tell how, what happened to, to their family, what is going on with wild, chimpanzee population, how stressful can be the transport for, for these babies. And each rescue gives us the opportunity to, to create awareness and to explain what's going on. And um, yeah, I want you to remember that uh, our work is very special, even if we sometimes forget about it because we get too busy with uh, all the things that we need to do. 
but uh, a lot of people really would like to do what we do. So you need to think that even the smallest details on our daily work, it can have a big impact in our followers. And for example, the other day I went up and I was filming Billy and he could see himself in the camera. And it's just like small things that happen every day that we think we maybe don't think that could have impact, they do have. And uh, yeah, uh, to finish, like I think most than ever, we need to be very positive. We need to try to be positive because people are a bit tired of hearing bad news with the coronavirus and everything that is going on. So even if our work sometimes is also sad, uh, I think we need to to do posts that makes people happy so they can engage with us and they want to see our post and they want to keep hearing our news. So, yeah, thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was uh, fascinating. And um, just a reminder, if you've got questions, please pop those into the chat and we'll make sure that we uh, incorporate them uh, as we go into that. Uh, and now I'm going to invite uh, Alistair Binny Lubbock from Animals Asia to share some stories of uh, their success. Great. Uh, Hi, my name is Alistair Binny Lubbock and I'll just go quickly through um, what I'm going to do, talk about today, uh, quickly who I am, uh, who Animals Asia is, a little bit about the rescues and how they work in terms of how we tell our stories, and then something that's happened quite recently, which is how we've changed our tone. And it ties in uh, really well to what was just said about, um, you know, focusing really hard on the positivity aspect as well. Um, so just quickly, who am I? Uh, I've been working at Animals Asia for about a year, uh, just over a year now. Uh, previously, I was a fundraiser at the Green Party, so I have, um, although I'm a senior content manager, I have a sort of background in, in fundraising as well, which really helps when working across departments. Um, before that, I worked in events and ran film workshops with young people, uh, and uh, I work with amazing people across all different time zones, um, which uh, is, is really exciting. Um, and I sponsor a sun bear called Murphy, uh, but a moon bear called Twan has my heart. It was the first uh, bear that was rescued when I started working there and I think quite a lot of people have that connection with the first uh, rescue that they they see uh, coming across our social media and, and uh, yeah as, as I said before having that uh, personal connection is really strong. Um, so these are the uh, three areas that we work in at Animals Asia. Um, the sort of primary thing that we do is working to end bear bar farming um, and uh, we have two um, uh, Global Federation of uh, Animal Sanctuary accredited um, uh, sanctuaries are uh, one in Vietnam and one in China um, and uh, the other areas we have uh, work in is captive animal welfare we've started a pilot project doing ethical uh, elephant tourism in Vietnam uh, but we uh, work across all, all different kinds of um, captive animal welfare um, primarily in, in Vietnam and China uh, and cat and dog welfare um, which uh, yeah is, is across we work with uh, different organizations as well uh, we do a lot of education around cat and dog welfare um, uh, predominantly in China and Hong Kong as well um, so just focusing uh, quickly on bear rescues because they, those are sort of a big kind of events when we do um, a live bear rescue uh, there are currently 438 bears trapped across farms uh, in Vietnam um, and uh, Animals Asia has a historic memorandum of understanding with the Vietnamese government to bring all these bears to sanctuary. So um, since uh, I've been working, obviously COVID was uh, quite a uh, quite, had quite a big impact, but we were still able to rescue eight bears this year. Um, and we have uh, rescued uh, since we started uh, 637 bears. And there are uh, 187 bears in our care in Vietnam and 148 bears in China. And yeah, the rescues are a really huge part of, of what we do. Um, and they, they are sort of our most engaging posts that we put out. And we put out, uh, you know, a whole series of like when we first find out that we're going to rescue bears uh, to the, the journey to bring them to sanctuary. 
and then uh, the, the slightly more complicated information around quarantine, because people are often quite surprised when we've taken a bear from, from a cage and then it's in a cage for another 45 days while we um, uh, sort of uh, assess it and make sure that it's uh, healthy and, and all those kinds of things. So we've been doing a lot of work around um, extending the length of the, uh, of the rescue so that people can be engaged through that whole process. Uh, and that gives us additional opportunities to, uh, uh, to make donation asks as well. Um, and so, yeah, as you can see here, a lot of the, um, uh, the content we'll do will be live, uh, live streams. And we've got a really good bear and vet team director there who sort of narrates the live streams and is very sort of brings the emotion, uh, to the scene where, where the, the vets who are, um, actually dealing with the, with the animals. Are very you know uh, pragmatic and, and working on the um, on the on the bear itself. So it's really helpful to have that additional voice and, and people really um, uh, identify with that, which is really nice. And then on the side here, I've just got a, a little snippet of our Instagram as well, um, and showing we've we've been engaging a lot more with uh, some celebrities as well and getting a, a look and feel that kind of ties everything together. Um, uh, so that people, whenever they see our, uh, our material, they'll know that it's ours. And this is what we've done in terms of changing the tone. And we were doing this before COVID uh, struck, but it was even more uh, essential that we we made this shift. So before, you know, even just last year, our, uh, our sort of tagline underneath was until the cruelty ends. And that focus on cruelty kind of, unfortunately would set the tone a lot of the time in some of the conversations that would happen underneath our content. People would be very focused on the cruelty, um, very, you know, focused on blame and on punishment. Whereas now we are shifting to focus on what our work is, which is putting kindness in action. Uh, and so what we're really trying to do now is just make sure that we're showing stories of, of kindness, overcoming cruelty. Um, and it, you know, it's very proactive as well. It's, you know, even though, Quite a lot of the time we, we're showing just the bears on their own because we, we try and not have too much interaction with the, with the animals, especially showing that um, on social media can be a bit problematic. Um, it's really good to show that even just a bear being able to be a bear uh, in a in a sort of an, a semi natural enclosure um, is is an act of kindness and, and putting it into that kind of context. Um, so that's the that's the main shift, and that has meant that we've been able to bring on board. Uh, more people. It means that we're we're not, um, you know, Asia shaming or encouraging like xenophobia. Um, when we're able to reach more people and have that positive message, and it just makes a much better frame for everything we're doing. And it also meant that when um, coronavirus came along, while you know certain people in the media were um, looking for people to blame, but we were able to go out with this: the only cure is kindness message. Um, which really encapsulates a lot of the work we do. And obviously a lot of people came to us as Animals Asia uh, at the start of, of COVID and was focused on wet markets and, and things like that. And we were able to make sure that the conversation stayed really positive and, um, uh, and, and you know, really focus on, on progress. Um, I'll, I'll pretty much leave it at that uh, for the moment because I, I know that everyone will have lots of uh, uh, questions. And I think it's, yeah, it's, it's really important to, illustrate the impact of what you're doing throughout whatever you're, whatever you're doing. But I'm, I'm sure that this will come up in, in the questions as well. Uh, but hopefully that'll give you a bit of an idea of, of where we're at. And thank you very much for, for having me and for putting on this uh, fantastic webinar. Thank, thank you so much. That's, that's fantastic to see the rebrand underway there. Uh, very interesting. Um, I, now I would love to have uh, Tommy Wolf join us. She is the executive director of the Gorilla Rehabilitation and Conservation Education Center, or GRACE. Well, hi there, everybody. Welcome and uh, lovely to be here with you today. Uh, I wanted to share a little storytelling exercise that we did at GRACE over the summer. I always feel like nothing happens in August. <laughs> so it's just the dog days of summer. Everybody's you know, away, maybe not during the pandemic. But we really wanted um, to create something that would increase the intimacy with some of our, um, our list, our donors, our tribe, our fan base. And um, so I arranged a sequence of um, webinars 
where we invited people in. And we it was like a whiz bang tour around Grace. We really spoke about a little bit about everything, whether it were, you know, we did um five webinars total, but we we spoke about Gorilla Grub, we spoke about the rehabilitation, we spoke about what we're doing with kids and community, we had a conservation message. Uh, so we really had quite a tour around Grace and um and the way we handled it was we did a direct invitation to our list and we also advertised it on social media and we boosted our Facebook posts um a little bit. So and I'm I don't know if I had particular um <clears throat> fundraising goals with this. It was really just a sort I I passionately believe that building intimacy with your donors is actually the best way to keep loyal big donors. So it was more of an intimacy building exercise with them. Um, and the way we positioned it was that, um, you know, this is a slide from our first grower hour we called it, um, is that our goals were to get to know each other, to get to, have, to talk more about gorillas, to have fun on a Sunday afternoon. That ended up being all over the place. We, we One of the surprises was that our I set it up late on a Sunday afternoon and we discovered our donors are actually all over the world. I don't think we knew that. So we ended up hitting, you know, Monday morning in New Zealand. And so we jiggled the time around a little bit during the series. But our main goal was actually to have fun and to celebrate what was good about gorillas and what we loved about Grace. And um, I definitely didn't take all the load myself. I'm new-ish at Grace. I've been here about seven months. So I invited in all my team members and, uh, you know, to come and help tell favorite stories and share favorite pictures and do all sorts of fun things. So the frequency, it was quite intense. It was five weeks. We did it every single week. And we said to them, if you register for one, you're going to get every invite. And we actually asked for permission to experiment with Zoom and try and increase our own webinar skills. So we try to put it on, I put it on myself to try and do better each week and try something new. And I definitely did. And I think our, our audience was gracious with us as we tried a couple of weird things that were new to me, like playing music on Zoom so that we could do entrances and live streaming on Facebook, which I hadn't done from Zoom before and a couple of things like that. So, um, so let me tell you what was really good about it. First of all, it was absolutely caught everybody off guard as to how how great it was for relationship building i actually feel i know so many people in our base now and they feel like they know me if i send an email out there even if it's a mailchimp sort of you know template style thing they answer as i've spoken to them directly and i know where they live and i know a little bit about them because we've had them live on our zoom calls um, we grew our list by over 10% just through uh, requiring registration for them. Um, I took our Facebook insights over that period. And we don't do a lot on Facebook, honestly. It's a, it's a new, you know, we just aren't super active on it. Um, it's something we're trying to increase. But you can see that we got, you know, 92 new page likes, lots of post engagements, lots of reach. Um, and we discovered that we we can really rely on about one in six people attending the call to donate. We got brand new donors that were new to our list and new to our donor uh, database. Um, and we watched the donation amount increase. So I thought that was interesting. And I, I, I'm a huge believer that intimacy will give you bigger donations because people know, like, and trust you. And we ended up with five really cool presentations that we didn't have before, so that was good. I definitely mastered my Zoom skills. I felt like a bit of a Zoom DJ by the end. And then you never know who's watching. So I had a, a, a somebody that I knew, but he was not a donor. And he um, attended a Grower Hour. And a week later, we got a really sizable donation in the multiple tens of thousands. And um, it, it's hard. I, I don't know exactly how much the Grower Hour affected it, that donation. It's hard to know, but I think it definitely helped. So um, I think it was just that was really good. The lessons I'd learned is I'm not sure I'd do five in a row again. It was pretty intense just with a workload we created for ourselves. I, I will say our, our donor base loved it. I was amazed at how many people came to every single session, and um, but it was quite intense on the team. But I think the thing that I found the most valuable for moving forward is we really figured out exactly how to maximize attendance. 
And obviously, the more attendees, uh, the more engagement, the more donations, etc. So it's a useful thing to know how how to get the most number of attendees to our list. So I thought I'd share that with you today. But you're always trading off how many times do you send a direct email to your list versus annoying them versus overdoing it. But we found this is about perfect for maximizing attendance. Is um, Let's say you've got an event on a Saturday. We'd send a, a direct email to the list on Monday. We'd send another one on Wednesday with a slightly modified message. And then we'd send them a reminder on the day, but only to the people that were registered. So we didn't hit our list again. Um, we also had a social media boost, not much. I think we put about $20 on each of them. So that's not a very big boost, but that would explain why we were getting these enormous reaches because we don't have babies and cute things very much at Grace. I think we're a little bit more like the previous speaker at Animals Asia where, you know, our gorilla's always in the wild and they're, you know, it's just harder to find cute. So, um, so, but, but I thought that was a good use of $20 a week, uh, just getting that sort of reach. Uh, so, so I just thought that might be useful to see that that really gets us our maximum attendance. And we've been watching our attendance go up and up and up. So that's been really interesting as well. And I thought I'd just share some statistics with you. So Grace has not marketed, um, it hasn't really done list marketing in the past or not much. And our list is fairly small. Uh, you know, it's about 1,500 people. So that's not a, it's not every, <laughs> well, it just, it is what it is. Uh, but, and it's very much in our long game to try and increase that number. But uh, what we notice is we have about at, at least 30% uh, email opens. That's way better than industry average, by the way. The industry average is about 19%. So we've got a loyal base on our list that it's at 30%. Sometimes if I get a decent subject line, <laughs> it's a whole lot higher than that. We've seen it as high as 60 and 70% if it's if we do a good job. But, um, you know, so 183 registrants is the most we've had register. Um, webinar attendees are 65 attendees, I think, that we can pretty much rely on getting. Um, I actually would know how to boost that number, by the way. This was a number that came without a reminder on the day. Had, it, had I reminded them on the day, it would have been closer to 100, by the way. Um, and, uh, and I think one in six we think we, we know are going to donate. But the donations we found to be relatively small. So, um, so I think it's important to look at the, you know, where your list is and use that to inform your decisions. You know, if we were able to grow our list 10 times, which I can see, I mean, it hasn't been hard to grow 10%. Um, if that was a 10x list, then I just put in the same variables exactly. But then it would be $10,000 a webinar instead of $1,000 a webinar. And, and then I don't know how to credit things like... Um, like the, the huge donation that came in <laughs> so uh, so I do so I think how this this exercise has really informed um, our, our strategy if you like is um, first of all we would do it again maybe not five <laughs> but we were absolutely charmed by the relationships and the closeness that's built we got to huge numbers of compliments and a very happy tribe the chat box during our webinar was so um, noisy that I had to get people to come in and man it because there was absolutely no way I could cope with that while I was talking. So um, I think our, our, the people that attended really, really enjoyed it. Um, I think we also realized list size matters and it's strategic for us to grow the list. Um, we loved that we saw a lot of conversions from our Facebook tribe and our Instagram tribe to, to register uh, is that we now have on our list. Because, and I think that came from the boosts that we did. So our boosts were just to people who already liked our page. And I think that was a strategy that actually worked pretty well. I think that was all of our list growth. Um, but the larger the list, obviously, the bigger the fundraising potential. And we realize this hasn't been a significant source of funding for Grace in the past. And, you know, and I think it's always, you know, my job is to make sure we're using our resources wisely. So um, I think I would do more list marketing when I've managed to grow the list a little bit. But at the moment, you know, I think it's on, on the small side to be as effective as some of the other things we're doing. So um, I hope that was helpful. I think it's sometimes useful to see under the covers and <laughs> see some of the numbers and what's actually happening. So that's what I chose to share with you today. But that's it from me.
Thank you so much. That's that's a wonderful story. And I love the, the con concept of your tribe. I definitely want to pick up on that in a moment. Um, let me invite Karen Kemp now to share uh, from Lola Yabonobo or Friends of Bonobo. She's their communications director. So take it, Karen. Karen, we can't actually hear you right now. Looks like your phone isn't muted or your line isn't muted. Do you have anything else open like Zoom or Skype or? Or maybe you can check the volume on your computer if you turned that down for any reason. Yes, we can definitely do that, Jean. And let me just throw out, we're going to, Karen, we're going to take some questions while we get you um, worked out. Karen, is it possible? I don't know where, are you in the United States? I can send you a call-in number and you can call in on the phone. You want to type that in the chat and let me know if that might work. Well, we're getting Karen sorted out. Um, I did a couple of questions that occurred to me as I was listening to uh, our previous um, speakers. I wanted to follow up um, with Tommy to see if she had any particular Zoom tips that she would share for those of us who are uh, have to be Zoomers. Uh, if you've, how, how do we become Zoom DJs? <laughs> well, I think you've got to have nerves of steel to, to be trying new things when there's a whole lot of people live. It is actually kind of stressful. So I really did feel a bit like a radio DJ, honestly. But um, things that I have figured out how to do, um, if you go into the Zoom settings, it's pretty easy to play music when you start. So instead, so while people are waiting, or you know, if they're in a waiting room, or they, or you, or you're waiting to do something, especially if you're going to go and step away to set up your Facebook live stream, you can actually play background music, which is kind of cool. And there's just a little setting on the Zoom Advanced panel. We also figured out how to play video on um, Zoom, and you've also got to go in on the Advanced Share panel, and there's a little setting that you can check. So I think that's actually really important as well. And then we sort of experimented a little bit with, uh, do we show people's faces, don't we? Do we allow chat, don't we? Um, so there's a couple of things you want to disallow, like, you know, don't let people imitate because we had scribbles on our screen once. And um, I think it's much easier for the presenters to have no other faces to to. Um, to distract them because <laughs> there's always somebody who's doing something odd on their webinar. That's, it just can be distracting when you're trying to lead the call. But we actually felt that our we heard from our members, they loved being able to see who else was there and see who was talking. Um, I think it's definitely worth, especially if you've got more than 20 people on the call, having a tech like R Rory, our amazing um, communication manager, would come and help in the background with muting and unmuting. And find we actually put uh, our people from our tribe live so that they could talk or share a story and so on. But I couldn't find them fast enough to always unmute them and so on because, you know, we ended up having many people on the call. Uh, so it's hard to find them in the panel. So it's really useful to have yeah. a tip. Yeah, a couple of tips. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tommy. I think uh, Karen is ready to give it another go, so we'll give her give her the mic. Thank you. Can anyone? So, can you hear me now? We can hear we, you perfectly. Thanks, Karen. Great. If for some reason I just needed me to log out and log back in again, um, sorry about that. Um, so, what I want to do is a little bit different than what others have done. I plan on first just introducing myself briefly and then giving a brief overview of the way we think about our online communications in the context of our fundraising. 
and um, then talk a little bit about our recent experience with growth on our social media platforms, which has been um, both a blessing and a challenge. And um, then I'll talk a little bit about this year, COVID, and what we've experienced to do to that. And finally, to talk about a little bit about fundraising campaigns that we pursued this year and have in progress. So the slide you're looking at here is sort of a big picture view of how we think about our online communications. Um, we think about our social media as a way in which we inform and educate our followers about bonobos. Um, and the, part of the goal is to have fun. As other people have said, there's been a lot of bad news this year in particular, and certainly the work that we do as a whole is uh, always has a stressful aspect to it and it's, it's, there's a sadness to it. And so uh, that is definitely part of the story, but we uh, very specifically spend most of our time helping people feel how they can be part of the solution. And so that our tone is optimistic and kind and grateful. And that's been our strategy all along before COVID came along. And it, it makes sense because of, um, who bonobos are. So it's it's been part of our strategy for a long time. And we hope that by giving people content that they enjoy and they want to share and that uh, makes them feel good, that they will engage with us, whether it is uh, at first to um, share our content or comment on it or engage in a, a give and take, or and then eventually to maybe just step up to, to donating. And I got a little bit off kilter because of the technical difficulty and failed to introduce myself. So I want to do that, uh, go back and do that. I've been with Friends of Bonobos just since um, May. So I've just started in the middle of all this uh, turmoil. Uh, my experience prior to coming uh, to Friends of Bonobos with, was at Duke University. I was at the uh, public policy school there for a long time in communications and marketing. And prior to that, um, I was with the Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is the largest natural history museum in the Southeast United States. So I have experience prior uh, to coming to Friends of Bonobos of working with uh, telling stories around animals. And um, I'm glad to be back doing that. My career started in journalism. So uh, it's been communications with an intersection uh, with the environment for a long time for me. Um, so the thing about Friends of Bonobos that is confusing, I think, for our online audience is that uh, we have entities that exist in the United States, in Europe, uh, to support the work that goes on in the Congo. So I work with the organization Friends of Bonobos U.S., and I'm in uh, in the United States, and um, it is often part of our communications challenge to help our uh, followers on social media understand that we have this whole support network, and uh, that we we those of us who are providing the content on the social media platforms aren't sitting in the Congo. Um, so that's a bit of a challenge I think some of us uh, share. Um, so. We've had um, some interesting growth in our social media platforms. This is just a big picture view. If you look at, this is net new followers we had in 2019. We grew by about 6,000 followers. So far in 2020, it's 15,700. And um, with that comes really sometimes incredible reach for our content. We've had... Um, a number of our videos get, you know, more than 2 million up to 3 million views. And that's uh, a good thing. And it also is a challenging thing. As many of you have commented already, uh, we have cute baby bonobos. They're incredibly darling. And a big part of our approach to healing them and helping them recover is surrogate mothers. Um, Showing surrogate mothers with the babies, actually, we have seen over and over is the most 
successful in terms of audience engagement. People love to see uh, the humans interacting with the babies. The problem with that is that uh, uh, sometimes we see people commenting that they want, they see them as a pet. So um, it's a double-edged sword to have that kind of in engagement. It's increased the number of times where we have to explain um, that that's not, that they're not pets and they shouldn't ever be pets. Um, similarly, this is what we've seen on Instagram. This is uh, looking at most engaged posts. We've just seen a tremendous amount of growth in the last couple of years. And this is part of the reason that uh, my position even exists. Uh, up until this year, Friends of Bonobos was U.S. was one person. Now we are um, two and three quarters staff members. And part of it is to deal with uh, a lot of this, this growth and um, capitalize on it as well. Um, so this year uh, has been a real challenging one. As I mentioned earlier, uh, some of these videos get great engagement, but they've also led to some comments that we've had to address very directly. Um, people have seen this particular video of a mama interacting with an, a baby and commented that, you know, this is a risk of spreading COVID or even Ebola. And so we've had to make a standard practice of putting this note uh, about bonobos not being pets and also how we handle their quarantine when they arrive to make sure they don't pass along any illness and that they're uh, separated from other bonobos and other humans when they first arrive. And we've had to make this a standard part of any uh, posts that we put on social media that um, shows a human interacting with a bonobo. Um, and I think it's a, it's a good thing. It helps people understand how we work. And for those who follow us regularly, those messages, uh, they've read it once, they know what it says, and it just with a glance reminds them. Uh, for people who are new, they can get the message right away. Another thing about this year that I think we've all been dealing with <clears throat> is compassion fatigue and our concern about it. Um, for us, it's been helpful that our overall approach to messaging on social media is uh, emphasis on the positive because um, I think that particularly in this year, um, we've struggled to find appropriate times to share the difficult parts of our story. Um, also about timing and awareness of related and unrelated events. I think that's been particularly challenging uh, in the United States. Uh, I'm sure it's challenging everywhere else too, but here in the United States, our particular challenges relate to the um, uh, racial justice movement that has just uh, really burgeoned this year. And, you know, key events that have happened during the course of between the spring and now that we have to be aware of when we're posting content and uh, is it fitting into the, the narrative and what people are paying attention to online. Um, I think it's something we always have to be aware of when we're doing social posts, but especially this year, it's been more challenging. Um, one thing I wanna mention too overall about our approach to uh, what we post online is that our uh, philosophy is that about 10%, maybe 20% of the time, we would be asking for support and donations. The rest of the time, somewhere between uh, 80 to 90 percent of the time, we're just educating, sharing information, talking about our work um, and helping the follower feel a part of the solution. Um, so I think that uh, is a big philosophy that we follow in our fundraising. Um, so just as just the last slide, I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the campaigns that we've had this year and also have going on presently. Um, this year was an un unusual uh, in that Giving Tuesday Now occurred. I don't know how many of you participated in that. 
Uh, we're all familiar with Giving Tuesday, the first Tuesday in December. And this year, uh, some large global philanthropists organized Giving Tuesday now in response to coronavirus. And it was a challenge for us to figure out if, if this made sense for us to participate in. Uh, our work is very much related and was very much affected by the virus. We had to close down the sanctuary, as I'm sure many of you also did, and lost revenue due to the closure. Um, but there were so many, so many needs um, coming up that we weren't sure whether our uh, participation made sense. But we did it, and we were surprised that it was was successful. We met our goal and slightly exceeded it, and um, we're glad that we had participated in that. Um, we also plan to participate in Giving Day for Apes. I think that. Uh, we have seen, partly from our experience with Giving Tuesday now, that uh, it helps in the fundraising effort if other people are engaged as well. If you're part of a bigger online story that's being told, uh, your message will get um, more attention. I, I think of it a lot like if you have uh, the only restaurant in town you might think you would do the best business, but in, in fact, uh, you do better if you're on a street that has three or four restaurants and attracts a lot of a lot of uh, foot traffic. So it's a similar concept, I think. Um, we are currently engaging uh, the slide on the left that shows nine baby bonobos have been rescued this year. It's a record year for us in terms of rescues. So. We've had a big challenge in dealing at the sanctuary with this number of incoming uh, rescues and telling their stories. So our campaign that's going on right now is focused on increasing the number of uh, givers we have to our monthly, who are giving monthly um, sustainers, uh, because we see that as the best way to ensure um, funding for the long haul and th that is stable. So um, that's pretty much what I had to present. I wanted to see if I overlooked anything. And I think that's mainly it. So I think we can move on to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. That was really, really interesting. Um, and uh, we've got several questions already in the chat, uh, which is wonderful. So thank you. And if you've got questions, uh, folks on the air or other presenters, that something you heard, please get those in there. I'm going to start with those. I've got some um, set questions as well, just uh, in case we need to kind of goose things along. But I doubt that's going to happen because of the lively group we have here. So let's start with a question from Molly Mayo. Um, and that this first question is for Itsaso, if you're still on the line. Um, and her question is, when you sent Grape Girl the follow-up story on that, did you email donors directly with the impact or did you post more information more broadly? So just kind of getting into the nuts and bolts a little bit of the, of the dynamics of that follow-up. Yeah, exactly. We did both. We posted the uh, pictures of uh, Kyungu, Grape Girl, with the packets on Instagram and Facebook. And we also put a, a history, Instagram history, with her eating more grapes. <laughs> and, uh, and then we sent an a email also to everyone who, who donates. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for Tommy at Grace. Um, the question is also from Molly. Um, how much interaction did you allow or prefer with the webinar viewers? How did you manage that? Well, I have a, I have a history here in a former life, but I've always equated interaction with how involved they're going to be afterwards. And I can tell you that of the people that did donate, they almost always were up on the webinar. So I think it's really good to allow, to encourage and allow it. And I would generally leave in a one hour webinar about 20 minutes for um, um, interaction with the audience. So that's open Q&A. And you never quite know what's going to happen. Sometimes it's a little quiet. Sometimes you can't get through them all. But um, yeah. 
Thank you. Um, okay, let me get back to the questions here. So we've got one from Caitlin uh, Bach from PASA. Uh, she is wondering, for, this is for all the presenters, uh, how do you continue to build interest in sanctuary residents that are older or have been there for a while? So we've heard a lot about the, the new arrivals and the, the charm of meeting a new face, but uh, how do you tell the stories of some of your older, older, older friends? Well, I can start uh, and talk a little bit about that. Um, I think the, the main way that we've done it is by showing progress. I'm hearing some things strange. Are you all hearing me okay? Yeah. You sound okay, great. Okay. So um, we try to show their life trajectory, sort of where they started when they came to us and where they are now, and also discuss um, – some of the adults um, social relationships in their groups uh, for the bonobos, a big part of their story is that they're matriarchal. So when you can show um, uh, how a bonobo has become a leader in her group and what influence she has on the other bonobos, people actually really enjoy understanding more about how they live. And so that's one way that we do it. I think we've seen, uh, sorry, okay. go ahead. I think we've seen the same situation where stories that really resonate on their progression. So if you show them when they were a baby and where they are now or how they've taken, you know, like one of our gorillas, Pinga, has adopted every, she's been a surrogate mommy for every single baby gorilla that's coming. That story really touches people's heart. So people do like to see the progression. And, you know, much as I think what what we've found resonates most with people is the more human-like the behavior, the more it's going to resonate. So if people can see themselves in the animal in any way, if they're protective or leadership or struggling or babies or any time they can identify a human-like trait, those stories go down very well. Yeah, I, I think the people as well, um, they associate quite well with the, the bears who've been there for a long time because they keep hearing them. So you often you know, get people asking, oh, what's this, this bear up to or that bear up to? Uh, also, a lot of the bears that we that we get into our sanctuary uh, have quite severe um, health needs. So quite often we'll we'll do check-ins around their um, their health checks, or if they have any particular operations or dental work or anything like that, and gives it a bit of an insight because obviously that's one of the only times as well when you have the humans interacting with the with the bears in a in sort of a hands-on kind of way as well. So and then once you've shown the uh, the operation or the, the procedure and you know has a bit of information from the vet so that people are feeling you know that they're getting the sort of inside scoop um, you can also show them when they're back out on 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 grass and, and doing their thing thank you those are wonderful strategies um, this is from Estelle Rabeland and uh, she's got a couple of questions one is um, do you consider using pictures where people are wearing masks, given that we're in the uh, the era of coronavirus and biosecurity? Um, so I'll just let you start with that one. Um, I'll happily jump in there. Uh, we uh, we have done a fair few videos and photos where people are wearing masks. Um, quite a lot of the content that we have comes from Vietnam, so. Uh, they they haven't been quite as badly hit as a lot of other places. So that kind of uh, is is not such a key issue, um, but yeah, I, I, we have considered, uh, for example, um, where in China uh, there's, there's they've, they've had a sort of drop off as well in terms of the the rate of of infections and things, and being a bit sensitive around whether or not it's it's showing people wearing masks. Um, but generally, that I don't think there's anything uh, bad about showing um, people wearing masks, especially in like uh veterinary situations as well thanks any other perspectives on that yeah i would i would um echo that i think for us showing people wearing masks was actually necessary because we did have reactions uh where people i mean for good reason uh there's the history of ebola in the congo uh, and the connection between great apes uh, and humans uh, the, the, that with that virus and the potential connection. I mean, we made a direct connection between coronavirus and bonobos because 
they are very susceptible to respiratory illness. And we close the sanctuary very specifically because the risk to the bonobos of contracting the virus, and uh, it could have been quite devastating. So the bigger challenge we faced at times was uh, receiving pictures uh, where somebody maybe is wearing a mask, but they're not wearing it in exactly proper way, and um, or uh, you know explaining why in some cases they're wearing them and sometimes they're not. So it, it's been a real challenge, um, but one where uh, and the other challenge with mask wearing is that part of what you're trying to communicate is this um, connection between the surrogate mother and the baby, which is often shown through facial expression. And you do lose a bit of that. So yeah, it's it's been challenging, but uh, we've really wanted to emphasize showing that we're being careful and uh, protecting the bonobos and the human beings as best we can. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I've got, we're coming up on time, so I want to make sure I get a couple more questions in. Um, one question is, how do you manage other accounts uh, using or stealing your, your images or stories? Does that come up for anybody? Uh, yes, we've definitely had that. And I don't know if my take is normal or not, but but I say if they need, if they love our pictures that much, great. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't encourage somebody to use them. And technically it's a copyright thing, but we are too small and too busy to worry about that, honestly. So I just feel like, you know, I get very zen about it and I pay absolutely mm -hmm. no attention to it. So, I mean, we tend yeah. to get our good pictures so much anyway. Probably everybody already knows they're great. So I just, I would take it as a compliment rather than a, than a copyright issue, honestly. No, we know. haven't encountered it very much, but um, uh, we we try and put a logo uh, on a lot of the photos we put out, especially with our kind of like new branding. Um, but yeah, I, I think and if someone's using it and they're you know, especially if they're crediting us, it's quite it's quite good in fact that they they take in it in in a lot of cases as long as they're not trying to use it uh, dishonestly or you know trying to you know promote another organization or trying to sell something, I think then, you know, we, we haven't, like you say, haven't really got time to, to, to worry about it too much. Yeah, I would um, echo kind of both what both of you have said. Uh, we get a lot of requests to use our photos and we just generally say, yes, you can use them, but please credit us and please make sure that you use them in a way that's consistent with our mission and our values, which is not to promote uh, great apes as pets, for example. Um, one of the challenges we've had too is, uh, given that we've had this huge growth in our following, is we're getting a lot of requests uh, to monetize our videos from viral video companies. And I'm not sure if others of you have encountered that. Uh, my, We haven't gone down that road, um, principally, we're too small to worry about it uh, at this point. And also uh, I have a concern about losing control over how our content would be used uh, and whether it would be um, in conflict with our values. Um, so um, I'd be interested to hear maybe on another webinar uh, discussion about that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great question. Um, we are at time, and I want to be respectful of uh, your time, uh, all of the presenters. You did an amazing job sharing your insights and, and the stories uh, and all the different approaches. I know uh, coming back with a whole new renewed uh, set, of, set of tools to take to this. And I also want to thank uh, our attendees uh, for, for joining us and for GFAS and for PASA for bringing this, uh, making this available to everybody. Uh, so thank you all, and uh, Robin or Jackie, if you uh, have any final notes you want to add, this this would be a great time to jump in. Did you want to well, jump in, Jackie, before I do some quick closing things? <laughs> I just want to say thank you for everyone to everyone. This has been just fantastic to listen to, and I've learned a lot that I'm going to be thinking about in fundraising as well. So great to hear so many different perspectives, and thank you so much for putting these slides together and giving us all a great presentation. And I definitely echo what Jackie said. Thank you to all the attendees. Thank you to the presenters. 
I will go ahead once the recording is processed and the link is up, I will send everybody, presenters and attendees, um, a link to view the recording. So again, thank you so much, everybody, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.